Woodward is he's so approachable and he's so humble and anything he has, this is the spirit of a teacher, he is willing to share with anyone. He's not worried about copyrights, he's not worried about royalties, he's sharing everything he's got and that is the mark of a true teacher. Would you welcome him right now back to this pulpit this morning? I am so very grateful for this meeting and for all of you. Look around at the crowd that is here. You've been here early this morning and we thank you. I am so grateful for all of you. The kingdom of God is measured in saints and I am so grateful we all get to be saints of the most high God and so many saints are here. I don't know whether this is what Brother Gleason was, was looking for or not. I sent this to the team yesterday after those incredible services. I said, this conference is a 9.9 .9 spiritual earthquake on the Richter scale. And I looked that up because I'm a teacher. A 9.9 .9 earthquake means severe damage or collapse to the devil's domain. Ha <laughs> ha. Heavy shaking extending to distant locations and permanent changes in topography on the ground. I think that's what's happening in the spirit in this meeting. Bishop Cunningham just leaned over and said that uh, $36,000 plus has been given in the offerings here, not including anything online. That is an amazing offering from the people of God in this conference. I think we need to do what Sister Shaw was saying. If you need a miracle at home, if you need a healing in your body, speak it right now. Lift up your voice right now and speak it. Jesus is in this room, and he's listening to what you speak. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. My, 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 my. Hallelujah. Go ahead and be seated. The book of Exodus opens with Moses seeing God's glory in the burning bush. And the book of Exodus closes with God's glory descending upon the camp of Israel and filling the tabernacle. You see, for the nation of Israel, God's glory was not a luxury. It was an absolute necessity. The Shekinah glory of God, it rested between the golden cherubim on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. But not only that, it directed them on their wilderness journeys through the supernatural manifestations of the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. Not only that, the glory of the Lord would at times move into place to defend them when their enemies attacked. And mostly, the glory of God set them apart from all other nations whose temples were vacant and empty of glory. But the nation of Israel would never have experienced the glory of God had it not been for a leader named Moses who hungered to see that glory revealed. He was a faithful servant, according to Hebrews 3, and he was the meekest man on earth, according to Numbers 12. He was also the greatest deliverer in Israel's history, according to Acts 7. And the reason is that when the time came, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to suffer affliction with the people of God. He rejected the chance to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than all of the treasures in Egypt. And that's why, before the glory of God ever descended upon God's people, 
or before the Shekinah ever filled God's sanctuary, God's glory had already overshadowed God's man. Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God on Mount Sinai. Moses fasted for Israel for another 40 days and 40 nights after they sinned with the golden calf. Moses was the man who made this bold request of the Lord. I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And that bold prayer was answered 1,500 years after his death when Moses was chosen to appear with Jesus in his divine glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's pretty impressive. So Moses had a unique calling that set him apart from everyone else. Moses climbed that mountain more times than anyone else. Moses had a face-to-face -face relationship with God unlike anyone else. And over time, Moses spent so much time inside the glory cloud of God's presence that he didn't even realize that he had absorbed some of the Shekinah, Exodus 34 and 30. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the face of the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near to him. Because the glory of God rested upon him, the people were afraid to go anywhere near Moses. He coaxed them to come close long enough to share what God had said. But as soon as he finished, he covered up his shining face with a veil. And that became Moses' custom. He would remove the veil when he was in God's presence, then he would come out and Israel would get to see God's glory for a moment and then Moses would cover up his face again. Verse 34, but when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel momentarily saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, and then Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. If we only had the Exodus account, we would probably assume that Moses was simply being compassionate toward the children of Israel. After all, these were the people God had called him to love and to lead. They were frightened by Moses' shining face, and they were absolutely terrified of God's mysterious glory. So limiting their exposure to it and wearing a veil all the rest of the time, that seemed to be the obvious solution. How thoughtful that Moses didn't want the people to be afraid of him. How considerate that Moses would inconvenience himself and wear a veil to protect them. So problem solved. Trauma avoided, crisis averted, mission accomplished. If we only had the Exodus account, we would think that was exactly what was happening. We would think that was precisely why meek Moses chose to wear that heavy veil most of the time. We would think it was all just about reverence for God's glory and respect for God's people. But that's not quite true. Thankfully, we don't only have the Exodus account. Some 1,500 years later, the Apostle Paul would write a letter to the Corinthians, and he would give us a much clearer understanding of Moses' motives, 2 Corinthians 3. But if the ministration of death, written and engraved in stones, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious, more glorious? Paul makes several theological applications from this one remarkable event in Exodus. First, he points out that the Old Covenant Based on the Ten Commandments, it was fading away, while the New Covenant, based on the power of the Holy Ghost in human hearts, it was becoming more glorious all the time. Second, Moses teaches that the Old Testament brought death and condemnation, 
while the New Testament brings life and righteousness. Third, he points out that the minds of the Jewish people, they were blinded to the true meaning of their own writings, the Old Testament, similar to the way in which Moses' face was obscured, and that the only way to remove that veil was to turn to Jesus in faith. And finally, number four, he teaches that believers can receive revelation from the scriptures when we, in the New Testament, allow God's spirit to open our eyes, remove the veil, and transform us into his image and into his glory. Do you know this church moves from glory to glory, from revelation to revelation? Now, those are all wonderful theological applications. But I see a powerful practical application to be found in Moses' mysterious veil. And I believe it has both relevance and revelation for the fivefold ministry today. 2 Corinthians 3 and 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. We are not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel, very important wording here, could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. So here it is. When the people saw Moses glowing with the glory of God, they were afraid to come nigh him. It would be so easy to assume that Moses put the veil over his face simply because he didn't want the people to be overwhelmed by God's glory. But if that were the case, then why didn't he cover up his face while he was giving the law to them? It's very clear that he did not put the veil on until he was done speaking with them. So obviously, Moses' veil was not motivated by the people being overwhelmed by God's glory while he spoke. Rather, the veil was motivated by whatever took place after he delivered revelation from God. The Exodus account is crystal clear. Moses would first let the people see that his face was shining, and then, after they had seen the glory resting on him, he would cover his face with a veil. Whenever he went into the Lord's presence, he would remove the veil to kind of get charged up like a battery. And then he would come before the people long enough to let them see that my face is still glowing. And then he put the veil back over his face until the next time. If Moses was really wearing his veil for the sake of God's people, then why did he let them look at his face at all? It's left up to the Apostle Paul to tell us what is really going on. It's not that the people couldn't look at God's glory on Moses' face. It's that they could not look steadfastly upon it. If we assume that Moses was covering up God's glory out of compassion, we entirely miss Paul's point. Moses' veil was never about hiding the glory itself. Moses' veil was about hiding the fact that the glory was fading. Moses didn't want the people to see that he didn't shine all the time. He didn't want them to realize that he couldn't receive God's revelation continuously. He didn't want them to perceive that he couldn't preserve God's presence perpetually. And he certainly didn't want them to know that he didn't always glow with God's Shekinah glory in private the way he did while he was ministering to them in public. Why did Moses wear a veil? Not because he was scaring the people, but because the glory that rested on him, it kept fading away. It couldn't be sustained indefinitely because he was just flesh. It appeared in those special moments when God wanted to use him sovereignly, but then it would disappear just moments afterward, leaving him ordinary like everybody else. And who wants to follow a leader that's just ordinary, a leader who keeps losing his glory every once in a while? 
So Moses would go into the tent of meeting to talk with God, and the glory would return and rest on him. And he'd come out quickly and speak with the people, and they'd behold the glory that rested upon Moses. But then he'd quickly put his veil on his face so that the people couldn't see the glory fading away. Moses wasn't trying to conceal God's glory. He was trying to conceal his own lack of glory. Even meek Moses hid behind a veil to maintain an appearance before the children of Israel that wasn't really quite true. He simply wasn't comfortable with the idea that the people he led might discover that he was in reality exactly like them, just as frail and faulty, just as fallible and fickle, just as prone to bad days and bad mistakes, bad decisions and bad moods, just as susceptible to depression and discouragement, just as susceptible to rejection and resentment, just as vulnerable to impatience and irritability, temper tantrums, spiritual doldrums. He was flesh. He was exactly like them. You feel that? That uncomfortable feeling? Even meek Moses didn't want the people that he led to realize that there was sometimes a considerable distance between his reputation and his reality. Sometimes there was a significant competition between his fame and his family. Sometimes there was a major conflict between his spiritual visions and his physical limitations. Sometimes, sometimes there was a painful fracture between the faith he spoke and the fear he felt. Only Moses knew that sometimes there was a great gap between the ministry in public and the man in private. I am not saying that Moses was a sinner. I am not saying that Moses was hiding some terrible, immoral sin. I am saying that Moses was a man, and Moses hid from the people sometimes. They had no idea because Moses was very good at wearing a veil. Even meek Moses had gotten used to the idea of having people look up to him, cherishing his wisdom, applauding his leadership, marveling at his insight into the scripture, honoring his service to the people of God. It had become familiar to have people following his ministry and hanging on his every word and indulging his every whim and imitating his every move. It had become normal to see people around him competing for his approval and deferring to his opinions and submitting to his authority and being slightly in awe of him. Yes, Moses had become bigger than life in their eyes, and that's why Moses now had an image to protect and a ministry to preserve. And it's also why Moses, the meekest man on earth, even he became very, very good at wearing a veil. I say to you today, and again, I would say what I said yesterday, I stand in submission not only to the great bishop and pastor of this church, but to all of these leaders so anointed by God. And they are welcome to correct and direct. But I would say to you and submit to your spirit, just like Moses, all leaders are tempted to hide their fading glory. Especially when God has given them powerful giftings in the Spirit. Especially when he has used their preaching in wonderful ways. Especially when he has done mighty miracles through their ministry. Especially when the body of Christ has recognized their anointing. Especially when the church has appointed them to leadership roles especially when their calling has taken them beyond the local church, especially when they've achieved and received multiple honors and accolades, especially when other leaders seek their counsel and their approval, especially when well-meaning saints sometimes elevate them on a pedestal, and most especially when they subtly begin to believe their own advertising. All leaders are tempted to hide their fading glory. But when leaders wear a veil like Moses, 
when they present a facade to hide their humanity, when they wear a mask to cover up all their imperfections, they inadvertently, unintentionally create a celebrity culture in the apostolic church. It is a culture that tells saints, don't you be honest about who you really are. It is a culture that inadvertently, unintentionally says only perfect people could ever be used by God. So I stand here to address you leaders today. 2 Corinthians 3.17, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We love to quote and preach verse 17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, and we should. But be sure you read verse 17 in the context of Moses' mask. There's a veil over the face. There's a mask over the mind. There's a cloak over the heart with Old Testament ministry. The tabernacle and the temple were absolutely filled with veils, curtains everywhere to separate the people from the priests. But that's not true with New Testament ministry. We all behold God's glory with an open face. We are all changed into the image of Christ as we all move from glory to glory. In fact, I would submit to you, Jesus died so that the veil could be torn in two. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say this. We don't need your best performance in the pulpit. We don't need your best mask in the ministry. We don't need you to pretend in front of the Pentecost. And I say to all of you saints, both this local church and those of you that are so hungry for this, that you have come from long distances, some of you, saints are powerful. Saints are wonderful. We thank God for every saint of God that is in submission to your pastor, but you're powerful in the spirit. You're not less than anybody else. You're God's chosen vessels. So just what is this liberty exactly? It's the liberty to be who God called and created you to be. Without performance for the rest of us or pretense for the rest of the church. Without posturing, without pretending. It's the liberty. It's the liberty to be grateful for the glory that rests on you while still being honest about the humanity that is in you. It's that kind of liberty. It's the liberty to have relationship with God because you're open face with him. But it's also the liberty to have fellowship with others because you're open face with them. It's the liberty to have true unity in the body of Christ because we love each other, we need each other, we protect each other, and we serve each other. It's that kind of liberty. It is the liberty. It is the liberty to appropriately let others look behind the veil in your own life. I apologize. I was trying to be politically, Pentecostally correct just then. It is the liberty. I'm going to take out the word appropriately because that's what we use sometimes. It is the liberty to let others look behind the veil in your own life. Here it is. You, you, you have no idea. Raymond Woodward from some little podunk town in eastern Canada. You can't even get out of there. Two flights a day. It's like crazy. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. The Fredericton Airport is my thorn in the flesh. <laughs> two chances to get out, two chances to get back. That's it. Here it is, the honor to sit with these men 
It was breathtaking to me. But the honor to sit with all of you is equally breathtaking to me. This is the body. With, with honor and respect. They're not the body. This is the body. We're all knit together. We are all able ministers of the New Testament. The glory of God rests on his church, not on a few people in a role in his church, but on his church. So here it is. When you only let me see your ministry, you inspire me. But when you also let me see your humanity, you help mature me. When you only let me see your strengths, you intimidate me. But when you also let me see your weaknesses, you motivate me. I think I can do it too. I can do that too. God can use me too. God's anointing can rest on me too. Five-fold ministry is not about you. It is about us. It is about this. Is it about, it's about his church and his glory and his kingdom. Wrestle with this. Still wrestling with it, by the way. So, five-fold ministry. All of you leaders, you are not supposed to be loners. Five-fold ministry gifts are not to be shielded but to be shared. Five-fold ministry roles are not for the promotion of the individual, but for the propagation of the gospel. I need to reach for somebody who's above my pay grade, so we continue with Paul, chapter 4, verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, we're just your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Let me tell you what he's done in the New Testament. He shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what he's doing in his church. For the knowledge of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's what he's doing in his church. So I submit to you, your face should not be veiled. Why? Because your face is the face of Jesus to others. That's why it should not be veiled. Help me, Jesus. So when... They look at your face. People in the world, people in the church, people in your church, when they look at your face, do they see an open face? Do they see an encouraging face? Do they see a face filled with approval? Do they see a compassionate face? Or do they see a closed face? An unattainable face. A critical face. An unapproachable face. Do they see Jesus' face in your face? Jacob was terrified of meeting Esau after they had been estranged for 20 years. After all, Jacob should be terrified. It was he who had damaged the relationship by trying to promote himself. He just knew that Esau was going to ignore him, shun him, hate him, or maybe even attack him. Imagine his relief when he finally saw Esau's face and it was filled with love and kindness. Genesis 33, last half of the verse. For therefore I have seen thy face, 
as though I had seen the face of God. And I couldn't believe it. But you, you were pleased with me. Jacob said to Esau, seeing your face was like seeing the face of God. When you smiled on me, I knew God's favor could rest on me. When you smiled on me, I know God could use me even though I was a deceiver, even though I did all those things that hurt you. When you smiled at me and I saw your face looking at me and it was pleasant and it was welcoming and it was affirming, I just knew I could be restored to my place in relationship with you. If Esau had still felt entitled to his firstborn position, he would not have been able to bless his brother who was stepping into a prophetic place. I would suggest to you that the fivefold ministry in the present could hinder fivefold ministry in the future if we feel entitled. Our job is not to block. It is to bless. It is not to look with an unapproachable face. It is to have an open face like Jesus that smiles upon the next generation as they trembling and they they walk into their destiny and we're there to cheer them on. We're there to smile upon their efforts. I know they don't have the experience that you do, but they're coming into their prophetic place. I know that they don't speak with the wisdom that you have, but they're coming into their prophetic place. And you have the choice whether you frown at them or whether you smile on them. You have the choice whether you cheer them on or whether you disapprove of them. They passed you a cup. I'd like you to take it in your hand for a moment. Simon Sinek, not a Christian to my knowledge, not a pastor. He tells this powerful story in a book called Leaders Eat Last. And he says, I heard a story about a former undersecretary of defense who gave a speech at a large conference. He took his place on the stage and he began talking and sharing his prepared remarks with the audience. He paused to take a sip of coffee from the styrofoam cup he would brought on the stage with him. And then he took another sip, and he looked down at the cup, and he smiled. You know, he said, he interrupted his own speech. I spoke here last year. I presented at this same conference on this same stage. But last year, I was still an undersecretary. I flew here in business class, and when I landed... There was someone waiting for me at the airport to take me to my hotel. Upon arriving at my hotel, there was someone else waiting for me. They had already checked me into the hotel. They handed me my key. They escorted me up to my room. And the next morning when I came down, there was somebody already there waiting in the lobby to drive me back to this same venue where we are today. I was taken through the back entrance. I was shown immediately to the green room, and I was handed a cup of coffee in a beautiful ceramic cup. But this year, as I stand here to speak to you, I am no longer the undersecretary. I flew here in coach class. And when I arrived at the airport yesterday, there was nobody there to greet me. I took a taxi to the hotel, and when I got there, I checked myself in. And I went all by myself, lugging my suitcases up to my room. And this morning, I came down to the lobby, and I caught another taxi to come here. I came in the front door with everybody else, and I found my way backstage. And once there, I had to ask one of the techs, you got any coffee? And he pointed to a coffee machine by the wall. And I walked over, and I poured myself a cup of coffee in this here styrofoam cup. And he raised the cup to show the audience, and then he said, It occurs to me, the ceramic cup they gave me last year 
it was never meant for me at all. It was meant for the position I held at the time. I only ever deserved a styrofoam cup. This is the most important lesson I can impact you with today and impart to all of you, he said. All the perks, all the benefits, all the advantages you may get for the rank or position you hold, they are not meant for you. They are meant for the role you fill so you can do your job. And when you leave your role, which eventually you will, they will give your ceramic cup to the person who replaces you, and that will be okay because you only ever deserved a styrofoam cup. <laughs> Say, what's that got to do with us? Oh, it has something to do with you. Verse seven, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and it's got nothing to do with us. It's his power. It's his authority. It's his glory. It's his kingdom. It's his gospel. It's his church. <laughs> Lift up your voice and worship Jesus for a moment. Pray in the Spirit. It's just us. Pray in the Spirit. Oh, <laughs> we have this treasure in earthen vessels. If you can be seated for one more moment, I'm almost done. We carry the Holy Ghost, we carry the gifts of the Spirit. We even carry the five-fold ministry in fragile containers. Yes, there may be seasons of your life when the glory of God rests upon your giftings and your ministry with all the celebrity of a ceramic cup. And God's sweet people, because they have been blessed by the gift they may inadvertently, accidentally, unintentionally glorify the vessel. I speak to the fivefold ministry today. Don't ever let it go to your head. Don't ever let it get in your heart. Because all the glory and all the honor and all the excellency of the power belongs to God alone and not to you and not to me and not to us. It's his glory. <laughs> the ceramic cup is temporary. The leadership position is momentary. The kingdom role is fleeting. And brothers and sisters, the glory is fading. So when they ask you for your counsel 
Or they want to follow your ministry. That's our lingo today. Or they hope you will be a mentor. Remember to talk about the fragility of the vessel while you speak of the majesty of the glory. Don't ever get accustomed to the applause and the admiration. Don't ever feel entitled to the deference and the reverence. Don't ever take for granted the privilege of ministry because always remember you only ever deserved a styrofoam cup. I stand here not only willing, but wanting to be corrected and, and whatever. But I would say to you that humility, not just authority, is the key to impartation. When you only let me see your authority, oh yes, you'll challenge me. But when you also let me see your humility, you change me. There have been so many spectacular spiritual moments in this meeting. I have been enthralled and encouraged and changed and challenged by all of them. But the moment that changed me the most... <laughs> was when Bishop was talking about his Uncle Billy Cole laying his head on the floor in the altar on top of his head. And when Bishop, who's probably seen more people receive the Holy Ghost than I've ever met in my life, when he leaned over this pulpit, and you could tell he was reliving that moment, and he began to weep, a shockwave went through this place. Because... Humility, not just authority. Humility is also the key to impartation. Because in that moment I thought, oh God, if I can just get a hand, if I can just get a ministry to cover me, if I can just get some, I'll submit to him, Jesus. Just let it be. Just let it be. He, he, he encouraged me. He helped me. He ministered to me. He lifted me. He changed me. Because he let me see for just a moment a much younger man. Not Bishop Jack Cunningham, the pastor of Bible World and the bishop of the Virginia district and a man esteemed among us. He let me see a young man <coughs> holding a styrofoam cup. Last scripture, you can stand. First Thessalonians. I reach back to Paul because I don't feel qualified to bring this to you, but Paul said it. To the Thessalonians, for neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. We didn't wear something to cover up. God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome. Oh, we could have called in all our perks and privileges. Yes, we could have, as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you even as a nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, watch this, not the gospel of God only, but we also imparted to you our own souls because you were dear to us. So we didn't just share the ministry and the authority and the glory and the gospel. We shared ourselves. I speak to you today and I say, whatever season of ministry I am in, whatever spiritual gifts I might have, whatever kind of cup God gives me, I know one thing. See, styrofoam cups, they're fragile. Styrofoam cups can get damaged by life. The physical vessel may get some holes in it once in a while. And that's okay, because it's just one more chance for the glory of God to shine out. And I know this, no matter how fragile my cup is, I for one, and I know you feel the same, I'm going to use my cup to pour God's glory, whatever rests on me, I'm going to pour it into the next generation. I'm going to pour it into the upcoming church. I'm going to pour it in to the last generation before the rapture of the church. 
Exposure to the fivefold ministry brings impartation, and that is why we are here. Would you reach over to someone and would you lay your hand on their shoulder or better yet, grab them by the hand and lift that hand high and would you pray in the Spirit right now? Pray in the Spirit. Don't just pray for you. Pray for them. Don't just pray for you. Pray for us. Oh, oh yes. 